Ooh, good question from GQ. Intersectionality versus Marxism. Is there a contradiction? I consider myself a class reductionist, unironically. Right. So this is a, a, a loaded question, and I feel like um, when it's posed uh, by people, depending on where it is that they're coming from, either from Marxism or from intersectionality, really the uh, some of the central questions, some of the central assumptions behind the question is, how is it that we're thinking about um, what are considered to be non-class struggles? So like the struggle for racial, uh, the emancipation of black people, the struggle for the emancipation of women. How are you thinking about national struggles for, for self-determination, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that often the, the Marxist response to this hasn't been um, as correct as, as it could be. And it's, it's usually taken the form of, well, the important thing in all of these separate struggles, whether it's the women's struggle or the race struggle or, or whatever struggle, are the universalist claims that are tied to class. Um, and I, I think that's not fully correct because the perspective that I have, which I, I think is the one that's the most in line with uh, the classics of Marxism, Marx, Engels, Lenin, uh, and it's one that's formulated uh, in this recent uh, uh, book from Domenico Lasordo, relatively recent, uh, called Class Struggles, which is that when the famous dictum, the history of all hit earth or existing society is a history of class struggles, it doesn't say class struggle. There's, there's as Lasordo uh, writes, there's no such thing as a pure class struggle. Expecting there to be a pure class struggle, class struggle um, is absurd. Class struggle is a universal uh, in, in, in the history of society, and it takes necessarily various forms. And what you find in a text like The Origins of the Family, Private Property, and the State is that Engels is, uh, makes the argument that the first class struggle in history is the class struggle against uh, patriarchy, the struggle for, for women's emancipation. I think that that same lens of looking at those various struggles, which uh, greatly overlap uh, but also greatly overlap with the struggle of labor against capital, but also have uh, certain features that are its own, certain specific features that are mediated by that general struggle of labor against capital, but that ex exists uh, in ways which cannot be reduced to the struggle of labor against capital. I, I think that those those fights, uh, the fight for black emancipation, the fight for um, national self-determination of a country, the fight for women's emancipation, the fight against racism, all of those fights are not like the separate thing that we would use the term identity politics for. They are forms of class struggle. So like the struggle for the emancipation from chattel slavery, um, where, you know, four million uh, black human beings were subjected to in the American South, it's absurd to, f to think of that as not a class struggle. When Marx is thinking of the struggle of the Irish against British colonialism, when he's thinking of the struggle of the Polish, when he's thinking of, of anti-colonial struggles, he's thinking of them not as these separate things to class struggle and to the, the struggle of the proletariat uh, against capitalism. He's thinking of them as interconnected uh, uh, with that struggle and as class struggles in their own right. So um, that's not to say that there isn't ways in which Bourgeois elements in those struggles uh, are the ones that are highlighted and, and they end up making, you know, the struggle for like women's emancipation or the struggle against racism about diversifying uh, the, the faces in high places, about making the bourgeoisie be representative of the um, racial uh, percentages of the population. So if there's like 15 percent uh, black people in the population, make sure that the bourgeoisie is 15 percent. Uh, black and make sure that its pundits are 15% black and boom, you have the emancipation of black people. I think uh, most people can see through that sort of uh, liberal, uh, very superficial representation oriented notion of emancipation um, and uh, and realize that, you know, something more profound has to take place uh, for, for true emancipation to be achieved. But uh, to go back to the the question of intersectionality, I, I don't think intersectionality and, and Marxism are compatible. Uh, I've, I've actually written in a scholarly setting that they are, but my my views are, are have been 
drastically changed uh, through the research I've done into the origins of um, the actual theorist of, of intersectionality, uh, which come out of, again, the, the, the spaces of the PMC, of the Iron Triangle, of the media, uh, the academy, more specifically the academy and the NGOs, and uh, all of those interconnect with one another and produce uh, bourgeois ideology. And more specifically, bourgeois ideology in our age has to be an in indirect apologetics of capitalism, which means that it has to be critical, it has to present itself as radical. But what it actually does, as, as Gabriel Rockhill would say, is produce a series of radical recuperators, people who end up through their radical lingo and radical veneer, recuperating a bunch of people who are getting radicalized by the crisis of capitalism and the difficulties that they're experiencing in their everyday life. They end up recuperating them into uh, the fold of imperialism, the fold of capitalism, and becoming not a substantial uh, opposition to, to capitalism. And that's why it's actually funded and promoted through these bourgeois institutions. I've called this in my work a controlled form of counter hegemony, right? It presents itself as it's as if it's counter hegemonic, as if it's actually challenging the ruling ideas in a war of position in, in an ideological warfare. But in reality, it's just uh, serving to reinforce both those uh, ruling ideas and uh, the existing order. I think inter intersectionality is, is a part of that. And, you know, the, uh, the difficulty arises in, in the fact that some of the references, some of the reference points that they have for their theoretical uh, development are black communist women, uh, are Claudia Jones and, and uh, Louise Thompson and um, various uh, women which have been engaged in the struggle against racism, the struggle uh, for the emancipation of labor, uh, and, and the struggle for the emancipation of women. And they, those, a lot of those have came from the communist movement. So there was a, a book that I reviewed a while back from Ashley Bohr that was called uh, Marxism and Intersectionality. And it made the argument that both are compatible. Um, and while they're not the same, and there's parts of each tradition that is incompatible with the other. Uh, generally, the traditions um, the traditions are compatible, and intersectionality has a lot that it owes from the tradition of Marxism and, and communist struggles. I, I I think that the, although that might be the case in terms of the appearance, you know, you have these people citing Claudia Jones and the theory of uh, triple oppression that uh, black women undergo in the U.S. because they're black uh, women and workers. Um, although that that their, some of their intellectual inspirations might be uh, those women, you know, the whole essence, the, the spirit that guided their theorizing, which was the struggle against capitalism, against imperialism, understanding the unique conditions of the women's struggle, of the struggle against racism as forms of class struggles that have to be accounted for in their own right, that have to be studied, uh, but in a way that's always mediated by by an understanding of political economy, uh, capitalism, uh, labor relations, uh, international uh, uh, relations. You know, you, you can't compare that to intersectionality, which it reifies all of these different struggles and treats them as separate. Right? That's the point of intersecting. Something intersects when it is not already uh, embedded in that thing with which it is intersecting with, right? The fact that they have to come and intersect um, is, uh, it shows that they're reifying all of these struggles, the struggle against racism, the women's struggle, the national struggles, class struggles, right? And class often ends up being just the last thing that they talk about, right? They usually get gender, race, and class. Um, I think that's a big mistake. I think we should see the essence of those struggles for emancipation as class struggles, right? The dictum is, uh, the history of all earth or existing society is a history of class struggles. They take various forms. Engels was clear that the women's struggle against uh, patriarchy is a form of class struggle. He says in a letter uh, to Franz Mering uh, in, I believe, uh, 1892, he says that, you know, uh, race is an economic uh, factor. It is part of the economic base, especially uh, in, in capitalist societies that are very racialized as as the, the one that we exist in in the U.S. So all of these struggles, I think they should be looked at through the lens of class struggle. And when we don't do that, 
not only are we limiting ourselves in the analysis of those uh, forms of emancipation, which intersectionality tries to separate from the class struggle, but likewise, when we, uh, when we fail to see the role of those as forms of class struggle, we're also uh, stifling the struggle of labor against capital. And this is something that you see in the Civil War very clearly. The labor movement uh, that existed in the North and, you know, the very weak one and almost inexistent one that existed in the South, it didn't consider the struggle for black emancipation as a class struggle. And so it, it produced what Du Bois called a, um, a split of the labor movement and, and it created two movements. It created on the one side the movement for free labor and free soil and on the other side the movement for abolition. And had these movements been able to come together, had these different forms of class struggles been able to come together and wage a general fight against uh, against capital, both uh, northern industrial capital and the southern oligarchy, slave oligarchy, the planter class, had they been able to do that, Du Bois says, it would have became an irresistible force. Uh, but <laughs> the labor movement didn't uh, care. The early socialist movement uh, didn't care. The only people that genuinely uh, cared were um, the the British working class, which was led ideologically by Karl Marx through the First International, and you know some of the remnants that were able to listen uh, to Marx, although very late in the game during the the Civil War, people like um, uh, like Joseph Wademeyer, um, not necessarily August Willich, although August Willich was was involved um, as a military officer in in the Civil War for the North, but the history of the labor movement in the U.S. in the 19th century. Uh, ignored or was antagonistic to the question of black emancipation. And in doing so, it shot itself in the foot uh, because it had a natural ally in the struggle for, for black emancipation. And this continues well on into, into the Socialist Party uh, in the 20th century. The one party that breaks that tradition and sees the struggle for black emancipation as a form of class struggle that's fundamental uh, in the struggle of labor against capital and that general struggle is the Communist Party. Right. So uh, from the beginning, the Communist Party has has really emphasized that struggle. And it's um, it's reflected itself in, in the fact that uh, in terms of uh, membership very early on, it was the party that was, you know, the most diverse, the one that uh, the the black freedom movement felt at home in for for many years. But that was a, perhaps way too long of a of a response. Um, so I guess if, if you do consider these different struggles as class struggles, they, they would still call you a, a class reductionist, but um, that's just rhetoric, I, I think, that's uh, used to to make themselves sound more radical and to make you sound bad and uh, to reinforce the existing state of affairs.